Hi there, and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'm super happy to have Kate Strong, our guest today on the show. And Kate is a vegan triathlete, a three times world record holder in cycling, a business coach, and a master recce healer as well. Hey, Kate, how are you? Very well, thank you. It's great to be on your podcast. I guess you're joining us from uh, your home in Wales right now. I actually moved to Somerset, so a bit wow. further south of us in England. But yeah, my, origin, my origins are Welsh. Very good. So let's get into it. You've accomplished so much and broken all these records. You're an amazing person. You're a great role model for veganism as well. I'm really happy also that you're part of plant-based health online. Um, and that's where I saw your your forward there that you did for the book that was out. I'll have, you know, Dr. Shireen and her sister on the show as well. And, you know, that's that's how I basically got in touch with you. But let's start with, I guess how you got into doing all this with your Ironman. And I think what was also interesting for me is like your motivation of entering it in the first place and what sort of drove you. So it'd be great to hear more about that. Yeah, I started triathlon in my, when was it, mid thirties after quite a horrible breakup. I've been with this guy for nine years and it ended six days before our wedding. And I suppose I was... Yeah, I suppose I was looking for something to to put me back on the map Uh, all through that nine years, gradually and over time, you know, I was being pushed to the bottom of the list of the things that that were important. So when I was left with, you know, having to redesign my life from ground zero, basically, I thought I need a big goal. I need something that is selfish, that puts my health, my mental well-being and has no real reason other than I want to do it uh, on the on the list. And that's what triathlon ticked. It, it enabled me to, to explore my own limitations in both mindset as well as health and physical performance. But it started to teach me the really important lessons of making sure that I don't ever let work, other people, you know, expectations, society to, to take away my life and make sure that I sort of compromise my values. So that's sort of how I started 10 years ago in triathlon. You also changed your diet, obviously, at the same time. And there wasn't as many options as there are now in terms of, you know, plant-based options. So how did you get into, like, the diet side? And um, was there something, I'm always quite interested to know, was there something that you read? Did, Did somebody tell you about this? Or was it from another athlete that you learned about this? And sometimes people don't always speak up about that, you know, as in the early days, because it's kind of like a secret source. Yeah, I mean, I was I was a typical Welsh girl. I lived in Australia at the time, just to note, in a village of 2,000. So it was a really small community. Uh, but I believed that if I ate a little bit of everything, it was good for me. You know, I, I used to obviously eat meat and dairy, uh, thinking that I needed it for the protein and calcium. I was bought into what society, school, and, and all the media has told me about food. Uh, but I kept struggling in sport. When I started running... After a period of time, after I got over the first, I can't run a mile because I'm so unfit, it was no longer my muscles holding me back. It was actually my lungs. I struggled quite a bit with asthma growing up and I could never resolve it. I was given pumps to help after the fact of an attack, but never to prevent it in the first instance. And owning a guest house, I'm blessed that I met a plethora of different personalities and people in my uh, in my business. And the people that I was naturally attracted to, like, you know, we always walk into a room and there's two or three people that seem to be shining in their own energy or presence. Those type of people kept saying to me after I'd come in after a run and wheezing and complaining about not being able to go further or faster, they'd just say very gently, you're eating too much dairy, stop drinking milk, stop eating cheese, and you will notice the difference and your body will reward you for it. And I couldn't keep ignoring these amazing people telling me the same advice time and time again, because this was over a period of months. So I decided to like put my ego to the side, put my, I know better than everyone else. And I believe what I use, I, you know, I like cheese, I'm never gonna give it up attitude to see what actually happened. So overnight, I just stopped eating all dairy. And within a week I was running faster. So it's about, you know, three seconds per kilometer faster, just over a week. 
which is enormous. Uh, but I also started to notice I wasn't wheezing. I wasn't, you know, struggling to get oxygen or air into my lungs. I didn't have that burn of vile, you know, bile when I was running as well. Uh, so I was within within that week. I then never touched dairy again because I felt how in, how negative it was on me up until then, and I could feel the difference. So yeah, totally. It was that moment of just strangers telling me that I needed to really address what I was eating that converted me. Yeah, and you also noticed um, other changes. So your skin started to change, and also your, the color of your eyes. Um, well, not the color, but they they went brighter. Yeah, completely. Um, I think because I was removing toxins. I have a natural sensitivity to dairy, obviously, which is why I had it asthma, but. Uh, I also used to struggle a lot with dry skin. I, I still do a little bit, but, you know, it used to crack quite heavily between my fingers and, and psoriasis almost. Yeah. Uh, that cleared up. My, my acne cleared up. I used to a couple of times a month have breakouts. That is almost removed. And if, if it does appear, it's significantly less. Uh, and as you said, my eyes, uh, as I lived away from my family, when I'd meet up with them every year or every six months, my father would say, are you wearing contact lenses? Your eyes look bluer. And my, it obviously was my toxin levels were being reduced and my body could remove the stores that it had been holding onto. It was amazing. Very cool. And at that time, what were the sort of common questions you were getting from people when you told them that you're a triathlete and you're on a plant-based diet? What, what sort of questions did you get then? And what questions do you get now? Well, luckily, living in a village of 2,000 people, I didn't know many people to ask questions, and there weren't that many athletes. So it, I wasn't actually quizzed or questioned, nor did I know what I was. Because obviously, after the dairy, I was exploring other food substances. You know, my, my world had opened up to maybe what I've been told isn't true. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I became plant-based without even me knowing what the title vegan was. I had to Google who I was. Um, so I didn't get questions or challenged at the beginning. I never met my coach. So they didn't know what I was eating. Uh, it was only after I started to go to competitions and, and see a different coach in person did they start to, to question my performance and ability. But yeah, you're right. Even to this day, I still get about iron levels. Being a woman, uh, I, I'm assumed to have low iron. And if, if I have, which I don't, I have been blood tested regularly. I'm actually above normal. Uh, and protein it is one of my frustrations that experts in the field, in particular personal trainers, and nutritionists, still harp on about those two levels in particular as a female athlete, where my, my performance, I've been eight years plant-based, uh, should really give them indication that what they're saying is quite ignorant. Because uh, I don't take supplements. I didn't back then. To me, they didn't exist. But yeah, it, it is frustrating for me. But you know, what can we do? We can just keep going on with a smile and proving that we know what we're doing and it's right. Yeah, for sure. And then moving on to your world record in cycling. And it happened, at, I guess, at a perfect time during lockdown when you were indoors anyway. So to do that all on, on a static bike for, for 24 hours. But for me, it just shows how much resilience you have to carry on, because I think you tried the attempt before and this was your second attempt Plus, what was amazing for me is that you did it on a, like I'm a cyclist as well, and you and you did this on a bamboo bike that you hadn't even trained on before. So, yeah. Uh, so, so tell me about that. Yeah, after triathlon, as you know, I, I became world champion in triathlon. And, and it was a struggle for me because to continue that was competing against others. And I'm not, I'm not a naturally competitively driven person. So... The world records were a way of me to still push to be at high level and push me physically uh, without, without competing against other people. And the bamboo bike is a great idea because it promotes a different way of us using reusable material. But yeah. never, yeah. never cycle on a bike in that way if you've never ridden it before. It was an absolute nightmare. But I didn't have any choices because, as you know, bikes were hugely in demand over lockdown and I couldn't get my hands on it earlier. And yeah, I just started training 30 minutes at a time, three times a week, and it grew to eight or nine hours over 12 months. It was fortuitous that lockdown happened. For all the around it, I do appreciate it wasn't a great time for many of us. 
but for the one element of training, it did work. And it was just yet another way of me pushing me mentally. I'm very into seeing where my limit is. And the only way we know that is putting ourselves in situations to see if I'm going to break and um, touch wood. I didn't break through the 24 hours, but it, it was brutal. <laughs> just to put a word on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I heard of some of the things that you experience, and like, I mean, I don't think I could, you know, the pain of, of the the pressure points that you mentioned um, in some other podcasts and, and, you know, the, the wounds that you got, um, but you still managed to, to carry on. I mean, where, where do you find that in yourself? Like where, where does that come from? Um, was it passed down from your like parents or, you know, where do you find that energy just to, to carry on and battle through it? I don't think with all the love I can muster for my family, it comes from them. Uh, <laughs> they're very much into sit in your comfort zone kind of people. Uh, and, and I love them for it. Uh, oh, I, don't, I, I honestly don't know. And I'm exploring it a lot with my, with my energy and healing work. I do a lot of spiritual work, as you know. Um, I think it's just this drive in me to leave the world a better place. And I know that sounds cliche, but, you know, from a very early age, I felt connected to the world. Like at 12, I chose not to have children, which is quite a young age to to have because I've never even kissed a boy at the time let alone contemplated birth but I, I've always wanted to make sure that I leave I, I'm seen as someone doing the right thing even if it's an uncomfortable path and I think that's what drives me forward and for the 24-hour world record some moments I couldn't imagine the next hour let alone the next 23 hours so I, I focus on one breath at a time so I do have the ability to sort of pull in my focus to as short a time frame as possible to keep me motivated. So I let go of the what if and what's coming up and what happened or didn't happen and just be in the now. And that really helps me get through some pretty gnarly areas. Mm, yeah, definitely. And um, do you practice living in the now in other ways as well? Like, um, you know, how, how do you refocus your mind not to, you know, forget what happened or, you know, forget the trauma from, from the past and, not worry too much about the future, but just focus in your in your present moment. What do you do to get there? I, I do I do my best to practice it at every moment. And for me, it's easier to practice when things are going right. Like I'm going away tomorrow for a two and a half week sort of holiday work thing. I'm not building up expectation and excitement because when when I feel bad, when the, the, the past comes back to haunt me, I've been training myself to not jump on that emotional train. So I practice, I practice in the now when it's going good so that when it's going bad and the pull is stronger, I can let go a bit more quickly because it's only about time. It's not like we'll never feel anything and never react because we're, we're surrounded by triggers and our parents are amazing because they, they know exactly the buttons to push to get us to regress to that five-year-old who's having a tantrum. Uh, but we just want the time between now and our reaction to, to choose what we respond with, not just put our foot down and spit our dummy out or whatever we do. Mm, yeah. And so it would be great to stay on the, on the, the spirituality side. And, and so you're, you're a master recce healer. For the people who don't know what Reiki is, can you explain what it is and how you got into it? Yeah, so um, I say Reiki, but I don't know how we say it because it comes originally from Japan. It, in short, it, it's an energy healing technique. So it's a way of being able to channel our intention, channel our focus and sort of connect to energy of sorts. So, so my belief, and this is how I describe Reiki, is we're surrounded by energy because it can't be created or destroyed. All I'm doing is learning how to be able to, rather than have those accidental moments where you're like, oh, wow, I'm in flow or something great's happened or, I, you know, we have that aha moment. Reiki allows me to do that with a little bit more intent and a bit more concentration. Uh, so it's like charging our phone. You know, our life is our phone, but the cable is what connects the electricity to the phone so reiki to me is like that charger it just allows me to charge it when i want it rather than accidentally yeah how did you find this i mean did you feel that you had like certain abilities like some people can see an aurora around people you know visually so how did you get into the subject 
I'd gone through yet another breakup and I could, I could see my life on repeat. There were certain parts of my life where you could rewind me 20 years and I'd be doing the same things. And I've seen, I couldn't seem to, even with the knowledge of me doing the same reaction and self-sabotaging, I couldn't seem to break that pattern. And so uh, after, as I said, yet yeah, another breakup, I went, I have to do something differently. I can't keep relying on logic and doing these men, you know, personal development and logical based courses. I have to throw myself into the unknown and the woo-woo. And so um, years and years ago through, through triathlon after certain competitions, a few of us as athletes would just give each other like a warm down and like a massage. And a couple of times when I'd be massaging, my hands would get really hot. Mm. So it was always like, what? And then when that happened, that person felt a lot better. They recovered a lot quicker or the massage went deeper or to the right spot in their body that they were struggling with. And, and I was like, well, is there a way I could turn my heat hands on, uh, on repeat? And that's what drew me to Reiki. Uh, I needed to get out of my head and into my heart. And as soon as I did the first course, mine was over three months. I've pretty much been on, on a healing journey for five years now, uh, unpicking and unearthing how well I remove my blind spots and that repeat pattern, but also be able to channel it and offer it to other people at the same time as well. Yeah. And can you can you recall what the um, most powerful healing that you've had personally from another practitioner? Gosh, each one brings its own lessons and gifts. Even the ones where I have nothing, I realized I went in with that expectation of wanting a powerful healing. And the lesson was, you don't stop your expectations. Um, I think the most powerful one at the moment was me realizing that I'm carrying my father's anger and my mother's fear. Because there's a new scientific research around epigenetics that we actually carry the unhealed trauma of our ancestors. Oh, wow. and, and, I, and I kept wondering, you know, I'm, I'm not very big on social media because I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of what people will say. I'm afraid of being judged by, my, by strangers. Yet that doesn't sound like me if we look at me in sport. Uh, and, I, and working with a healer, we were able to see that this is actually an ancestral sort of unhealed trauma that I'm carrying because my mother does live in fear for a lot of things. So I'm able to heal that part of my genetics. So now I'm actually, sounds very small detail, but I'm posting on social media. I'm, I'm not holding the fear of future back from me doing things today that I find a little uncomfortable. That I think has been the biggest aha for me to date but built on hundreds of others to get me to that point as well. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I mean, I had my first uh, recce session this year. And yeah, it was kind of like an amazing experience. Um, but there was a moment where she felt like she was undoing some knots in, in like my stomach without, you know, physical touching. Um, and then at some moment, I felt like a, a weird energy sort of being removed so to speak and it was kind of hard to describe but yeah it was I did feel there was something there when when I had the session yeah I I think you know science does us such a disservice by saying we have five senses what you felt is completely valid I believe we're sentient I re, I believe we can see different auras I, I personally haven't yet there are flickers I see it but not permanently so yeah. what you're experiencing is another dimension it's just we've been hidden by it you know, we're slowly getting back into it with quantum physics and, as I said, epigenetics. But science has a lot to learn for trusting our bodies rather than trying to read what's in a book and copy it. Obviously, you've had the healing yourself, but do you recall the first person that you attuned and um, what was their experience like? Yeah, I mean, and even we, we don't need a certificate. We don't need to like do a Reiki course to channel energy. So I think even in the past, like 10, 20 years ago, I've been healing people, albeit sporadically and unknown. Uh, so, but I think the first conscious client I had that, that paid me, they were quite resistant. I think they were a friend who felt obligated. And I'm, I'm mindful I don't, you know, share private information, but sure, through, the, yeah. tr through the treatment and the healing, it, it was around their heart chakra. So, you know, the, our heart area, which represents love and relationships, et cetera. 
that there was a blockage. So similar to what you experienced, I was removing this blockage and they kept thinking about somebody in their past that it ended quite tumultuously, a bad breakup basically. And the next day that person bumped into their ex and they hadn't seen them for three and a half years. And they they knew that if they hadn't have had that treatment or gone through whatever they, they experienced in forgiveness almost in the treatment, they wouldn't have been able to have seen that person on the street without creating an argument, but they were able to just walk past and, and be neutral about it. So mm. it was it was hugely powerful to hear that. I did nothing for that. That was them, me offering the healing and their healing in a guide, healing what they knew they needed to look after. And it just shows we're all connected and time doesn't exist. And yeah, because how would I, we have known otherwise they'd have bumped into them? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And how does it feature in your sort of daily practice then um you know uh, every day are you, are you are you working with with recce yourself in in the in a way i do i do I've, it's become almost an you know an unconscious pattern i do every so every day uh, if only at the end of the night i just sort of check in on myself to make sure if i need any extra help uh as I said, time is a construct. So if I know I've got a big event coming, I will make sure I've sort of put some energy stock in there. It's like praying for, you know, we pray for you to do well on stage. We pray for you to do well at that job interview. I use Reiki to be able to sort of future, put a bubble around there and only let greatness come through. And greatness doesn't mean success. It means the lessons I need in a protective environment. So sometimes it is you know, a, a failure, but it's also something that I greatly need. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm also massively into plant medicine and giving myself time away from the pattern. So at least two times a year, um, I set up like a little spiritual room where I bring my plants in, uh, light some incense and make sure that I have eight to 10 hours or however long I need in that day to be able to just disconnect, I put a mind map on, a mind fold on so I can't see and just really go deep into my journey to find out what I need and what lessons I still need to overcome to keep yeah. my path moving where it goes. Yeah, and has it ever led you to other things, um, looking at things like uh, psychedelics um, or ayahuasca um, to, to get even more connected? Is that something that you've looked at or thought about? I've, I've actually done that. So. Four years ago, I went to Holland because it's legal there, just to put a note. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it was very important. Like, I, I'm very in compliance. This is doing something illegal. I, it shouldn't be, but I couldn't I couldn't honestly go into a trip like that. So I did do a, a psychedelic trip with truffles in Holland in, in a retreat with a shaman, with other practitioners, it wasn't just about the mushrooms. It was also about breathing exercises, meditation, guided walks. So it was it was the whole experience of spirituality. And yeah, ever since then, I, I, I do make sure I have a, every six months, if only by myself, a, a, a way of seeing the world from an altered perspective. Uh, I only use uh, medicine from the country I'm in. So uh, I, I haven't tried ayahuasca yet because um, that's from Peru, and I'd love to honour the plant, the way it was built, which is on the plant, you know, in South America, basically. Yeah, and thinking about that retreat, um, what what did you, what was your experience like um, when you consumed it? Um, were, were you, did you, were you visited by a animal spirit, for example? Some people I've spoken to have experienced things like that as a guide. But I think that's probably a bit more like ayahuasca, I think. Yeah, I think for me, I, I, yeah, I, it was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my life. I, I was completely conscious, very physically, like it wasn't like I went somewhere else and I was very much in my, in my body on this planet. I'm very much in a safe space as well. As I said, we had guides around us who were not, taking part in this ceremony and um, the the only way I can feel describe it is I felt immense love and deep connection to myself like it's the first time I've actually 
truly loved myself. Um, through, through the ceremony, I actually asked to leave the room and I found a mirror and I just looked in the mirror and I started to cry. And I was like, you know, I love my crow's feet. I love my wrinkles, you know, I love my gray hairs. I love, I love this little wobbly bit on the back of my arm. All the things I used to hate on me, I loved. And then I started to love the people around me and then love the, you know, it was just this immense connection to realize each one of us has such an important place on this planet from, you know, the nitrogen bubbles in our soil to the oxygen in our air to the, all the plants and animals. And yeah, this sort of connectiveness and the importance of us all being here really just sort of landed and impressed on me. And even like four years later, it's still with me, uh, you know, and that is really important. It just allowed me to connect on such a deeper level with myself and others. So um, yeah, and, and to be with 10 other people on their own individual journeys, because some were crying, some were letting go of the pain. Others were, you know, experiencing a future that they were, they were afraid of and they're now living in. It was just amazing for us all to, to come together. But the one thing was that we were all connected, we're all one. Um, love is the only thing that matters, really. Yeah, for sure. I think it's so important that, you know, for people to love themselves, you know, because that's that's the heart of why you also go through things like self-sabotage, right? Um, where you don't actually respect yourself and you'll be working so hard to please other people but you don't always and it's not being selfish it's actually just showing that you do need to care about yourself as well um in order for then you to love other people i mean i think it's vitally important yeah when when i'm in a bad place when i haven't eaten well when i'm stressed when i haven't done my daily routines I'm only thinking about myself. I start to get worried about when am I going to get my next client? Where am I going to get you know, enough money to be able to pay my rent? I'm only thinking about me. When I'm thinking about expansiveness, when I'm thinking about how can I serve best? How can I make sure this, you know, I, I volunteer for a few charities. Like, how can I make sure the people that I'm serving and the animals I'm protecting are protected more? It's because I'm actually in a good place. So I'm able to, when I, when I am healthy, happy, sleeping well, taking days off, even though my to-do list is long, I'm able to serve hundreds of people more and create a lasting impact rather than just looking after me. So yeah. it, it's, it's a bicycle wheel. The, the, the more centered to the middle bit, the bigger the wheel and the faster we'll go and the more we can carry. So yeah, let's be selfish and make sure all of us are healthy and happy first. Yeah. And when you are doing your um, professional business coaching, does does any of this come out when you when you talk to clients, or um, it, do you do you sort of form some of your practices there? You know, when when you're dealing with you know goals for for management, or you know personal coaching, or you know the lifestyle work that you do, do does any of this come out there, or do you reflect on that, or are they interested to know more as well? Yeah, and it oh it it can't not because it's me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and at the end of the day, even the biggest of companies is run by people. So the reason why there is a, a blockage or a, a sort of issue in work, if someone's if a company is employing me because of a sort of problem they need to overcome or they can't grow, there is a block within that individual or within that team that needs to be resolved. Uh, typically, fear. Uh, or scarcity you know that element of if I control it I can't it can't go wrong or it, it, I won't be left behind when that's dealt with the company typically grows as well there is also strategy in place I'm not going to say we just sit around and chant under a tree um there is there is also the plan but it's the people that implement it that's the most important yeah and and how are you going about finding your clients um is it from word of mouth? I mean, and, and is there for people watching, perhaps there's, there's somebody who might want to work with you? Like, so what, what would be the sort of ideal clients for you? Um, how people find me is purely by word of mouth. I, I don't advertise per se. Uh, I, as you know, I've got an upcoming challenge and businesses want to be involved in that challenge. And that's how we're working together as well. So I think people just, if people resonate with my message, they find me and that's how my business grows and how I find my clients. Uh, but yeah, so it is very hit and miss. 
but again, it's trusting that I'll always have enough. So it's teaching me a lot to remove my own fears and limitations around scarcity and, and my money mindset as well. Yeah. And um, so let's talk about your next challenge, which is riding around the circumference of, of Wales in six days, I think, and that's a thousand uh, kilometres. And so how did you come up with that idea? Yeah, so my partner and I are doing this at the end in September. We're leaving September the 11th. It came up with an idea of, well, next year I'm cycling a little bit further, which I'm sure you'll you'll share in a minute. And so this was a great way of us practicing. I've never done a multi-day adventure before. I've never done a multi-day adventure or any sort of sporting challenge with somebody else before as well. So we thought, why not just take a week off work go cycling around Wales, see a beautiful country, my birth country, and also raise money for a mental health charity along the way. Uh, and just to add fun to it, we thought we'd build our own bikes out of bamboo pieces as well. So that's where we currently are at the moment. So you're currently building the same structure of bike that you had quite a tough 24 hours on last time, but you, you now you're building your own, I guess with your engineering background, that, that will help as well. But one thing that, for cycling long distances and obviously you've got the structure and rigidity of, of the actual frame. Um, can you replicate that as similar as you could do with like a carbon fiber bike? Yeah, hundred percent. So bamboo is, you can build a house out of it, a four story house. It's one of the most versatile products in the, in the world. And it's a hundred percent renewable because it, it grows every five years. Yeah. Uh, so, so the rigidity of this isn't a problem. And to, but what to about find the flex, the flex of it? doesn't it no there's no flex uh it's as strong as steel pretty much and it's wow. about the same weight as a steel bike as well so not as light as carbon but it does the job uh and we're binding it with hemp so fabric we've dipped in re resin we're then tying off the corners so it will not move at all uh so, and we're riding on normal wheels with normal handlebar and saddle uh so that that stuff is what you'd normally see on a bicycle Oh, wow, that's amazing. Okay. Great to see some pictures of it, if you, if you have some to share. Let's make this from this. Measure. Mark. Cut. Cut some strips of hemp. Mix the resin. And bind the pieces together so it looks like a bike. And don't forget the 101 other steps in the manual to make sure that your bike is roadworthy. What about the components that you're using on the bike? Yeah, uh, we've got a bike mechanic who's helping us with that. So they, they will be what you see on any normal bike, normal gears, normal yeah. pedals, uh, disc, we're using disc brakes. That's the only difference uh, than normally I'd use uh, clincher brakes, you know, the ones yeah. that pinch at the top. Uh, that's, that's the only difference for us. And that's more because of the weight of the panniers. On a downhill, I don't really want to trust clincher brakes in case oh, yeah. I need to stop quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially in those hills in Wales, they can go pretty steep. Yeah, well, the whole thousand kilometres is equivalent in climbing to one and a half times Everest. So it's no going to be pretty legs. Yeah, crazy, yes. isn't it? Uh, are you going to be training your legs like with like heavy weights in the gym, perhaps before, or are you just going to be training on on other hills to to train for this what, what what sort of routine are you going through i've written my own training routine i'm looking it's written on my wall just there and it's okay. just like it's a different bike because obviously the bamboo bikes aren't finished but yeah we just go out a couple of hours every every day or a long longer rides three times a week to get used to cycling in our legs um, yeah. i unfortunately am going away for the rest of the month so i'm not going to be able to get much training in at all but when it's not a race, that's the beauty about this. This is not for world record. It's a connection, and I think you know if we do it slowly, we do it. It's it's not about finishing with a smile. It's about finishing it and making sure we inspire people to join us as well, potentially. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it sounds so cool, and and hopefully you'll get like you say maybe people along the way who might join you on route, is is what you're hoping yeah. for as well. Yeah, we've opened up. The last day from Swansea to Cardiff, where people can come and cycle with us. And we're also okay. holding an after party that evening. So um, people can either cycle the 70k, 25k, or even 5k for the for the kids. 
uh, and that's all available to re- it's free to register we just need to know for numbers it's free to register on our website yeah and how are you planning to fuel yourself uh, in those six days I think um as it isn't a competition I don't need to be so rigid as I used to be in the past it's obviously 100% plant-based I'll uh, and we're relying on the generosity of strangers so I've I've cherry picked a few vegan restaurants I really want to look at, like look at and visit whilst I'm in the area. But otherwise, typically it sounds boring, but I just carry a bag of couscous with me. And if there is absolutely nowhere to eat, I can always find a tomato and cap- um, you know, bell peppers and things and boiling water. Mm. And I can make a decent nutrition, nutritious meal. Uh, it's easier to cook couscous than quinoa because that would be my usual one go to favorite but yeah we'll find out yeah yeah you just just bang it in the hot water and it's just you know just just ready to mix it in and maybe put some uh, tomato puree in there or something (laughs) yeah 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 at worst we can just live off that for six days I don't intend to but you know we can pretty much eat anything we want because we'll be burning so many calories it's quite a nice luxury (laughs) and and how would that be different from when you were doing it when you were looking you know at breaking records what would your diet be then I would still be going whole food so I do my best to stay away from the processed food anyway um what would be different is whilst I would be cycling each hour or half hour or whatever whatever time frame I've decided I know what I'm going to be eating in advance so I'd have bars ready lined up or I love sort of dates with walnuts little mixtures like this or rice if I'm getting over too tired of the sweetness they would every hour or whatever I'd have my own nutrition plan and hydration plan uh, to make sure I'm getting enough in because I can't afford to run out of energy because I'll know I have a race or a a time to beat yeah yeah for sure Uh, I think in the um in the 24 hour race you did some experimenting with with having more fiber um versus and and it caused some some issues in your in your stomach but you managed to sort of resolve that versus having something that's going to be easily digestible but now for for that challenge it's okay because you know you're not not doing a record but i guess moving on to your limitless challenge that you're working on which will be for next year which is now you've decided to change it up a little bit as well so yeah it'd be good to know about obviously that challenge but how you're planning to you know eat during that as well yes thank you and yeah it's evolved so originally the limitless challenge was me cycling the 3,000 miles in a race across America which is why we were trialing how much fiber I could take because I needed to cycle America in 10 to 15 days which is you know not not only sleeping two three hours a night basically and eating and cycling for the rest wow after that I was going to swim the English Channel and then I was going to travel to Nepal and attempt to summit Everest. Uh, and it, it was an epic adventure that I created to keep myself challenged and highlight the importance of you know, climate change, et cetera. And I realized, hang on, I'm flying 10 people to the States and then flying back. You know, there's a, there's a lot that's actually out of alignment with my values around minimizing my footprints. So you're right that climate change, um, Challenge 3000 has been born out of limitless challenge. So I'm now cycling 3000 miles in my home country. So I'm cycling around the coastline of England, Scotland and Wales over three months. Because why are we always in a rush? Why am I always in it like you have 10 days to do America? Like, no, three months, enjoy yourself, build in time to actually explore and have days where you don't know what you're doing uh, and stop to do uh, workshops, stop to do get beach cleanups, learn about this beautiful country rather than just zipping through it to tick it off my list. So that's what I'm doing next year, starting on World Environment Day, which is the 5th of June. Wow. And along the route, you're planning to visit schools and communities and and getting them involved and and talk about, you know, climate change and um, hopefully more also diet as well, obviously being the main contributor to climate change. so um, have you already got your routes planned and where you're going to stop? Is there somewhere where some people can see what your route plan will be in case they want to meet you? Um, it's loosely planned. 
uh, I'm very much open. So somebody approached me who's 40 miles inland from the coast. I'm visiting them. So there's a lot of scope for wiggle room. Uh, I'm planning it in August. I, I, I haven't done it yet because there was I, I was planning to order Wales in honesty and I, and I run everything by myself. So it, I'm quite time poor. But ultimately, yeah, I'd love the more people who can join me, the better. If you've got a school or a community or a group of people or, or just yourself and you want to hear more about climate change or share what you're doing, I'd love to, to pop in and visit. This isn't just the presentation of Kate Strong's knowledge. This is about connecting communities. This is about me learning and growing and taking that knowledge with me and sharing and then passing it along. Uh, you're right, like nutrition is one, a hugely important part. But I think there's a lot of other things we can do, uh, like rewilding our back garden, like not mowing our lawn, you know, planting wild seagrass, uh, loads of crazy adventures that take us like two minutes, but can actually help us tip the balance back into protecting our environment rather than steering ourselves towards this climate crisis. Yeah, for sure. And all, all these little things will start to add up, right? If, if enough people start doing them. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we don't all have to be zero plastic, but if we were all 5% less, that's huge. So it's all about just taking that one step, even if we don't see what the, in the bigger picture how it can help. You know, that one little step, that one little change will add up. And we'll build on it because in a year's time, that little step will be so far away from where we currently are. But it's about getting people into that first step that, that's Challenge 3000 that's pushing me around. Yeah. And um, would you say, you know, based on all the stuff that we've been talking about today, it, it, is this a reason that you're moving away from records and championships and, and really want to push more on the collaborative sports uh, event side? Yeah, I think it is. I think also being being at the pointy end of sport, like you know the top 0.1 percent, it's very lonely. Uh, it's it's very isolating. That and that is not how we live. I thrive off being in community. I thrive of working with others. So why am I treating part of my life in such an isolated way? Uh, it, I think. For me, anyway, my evolution is about connection and collaboration and using that as a place for all of us to grow. Uh, I, you know, the analogy I have is hiking a mountain. We always walk at the pace of the slowest person. So why, why, why am I pushing myself forward to the top of proverbial Everest when my country might be struggling? You know, it's, it's, it's my responsibility to make sure we all walk at a faster pace, but we're all walking together as well. So yeah, definitely. My, 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 I've healed enough now. I don't need to prove anything to me. I'm now here to like hold my hand out and say, let's do this together. You're not alone. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, I, I wish you the best of luck in the Wales tour and also for next year's Challenge 3000 as well. It's great work that you're doing. I'm, I really like that you're, you know, engaging a lot more people locally as well and, and getting them involved and, and, and spreading your, your message, which is, which is awesome. Thank you. And I'm not sure where you're based in the UK, but you're more than welcome to come and join me as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm in London. So, yeah, I'm not sure if you're, uh, are you going to be coming towards inland a bit more from, from that way? Are you planning to come? I will, yeah, I will be visiting London. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, I'll keep you posted. Uh, keep me posted, yeah. And we'll, and there's definitely a lot of uh, schools around this way that will be good. I'm sort of North London. So, yeah, it'll be great to have you over this way and um, seeing some local communities here as well it'll Be will be great. Yeah. Amazing. And it doesn't end after the challenge because the legacy is to keep to keep this to say, you know, the challenge 3000 growing in schools. So I think 2024 will be busier for me because I'll be supporting the schools who were motivated to do something in 2023. Oh, so do you think you'll do do it every year or is that is that the plan that you'll do another another challenge or or pick a <laughs> any thoughts not, about that? I'm not sure I'll do a challenge myself. I, who knows is the answer because, you know, something will be born out of those three months that I could never imagine. But I think other people will be doing challenges and I will be even stepping further away from the limelight and be behind the scenes to make sure that, like, the school that wants to, to, to plant 3,000 trees or 
you know, a community that wants to raise £3,000 and, you know, all of these little projects will pop up that I can then help facilitate rather than be the one who does it. But but we'll watch the space. I, I don't know what will happen. And it, isn't that quite exciting? Yeah, it'd be brilliant. I mean, this, it's this like ripple effect, isn't it, that we, we want happening. So to create these little sub projects in a way. Completely. Yeah. And that's that's all I want to do. And that's why the bike is bamboo. We need to look at disruptors. How else can we do it without, you know, taking away the fun or without taking away the performance as well? Do you think on, on the bamboo? Do you think there could be an opportunity here for like somebody to actually, uh, unless there is somebody already making bamboo bikes like professionally as a, um, I'm not sure how long the process is, but yeah, do you think there's an opportunity for a company to actually take, take this on board and use it as a, you know, I'm, I'm quite interested in on, on the material science things of, you know, especially when we're looking at other things that displace things like animal leather, for example. Um, so do you think that is that is an opportunity for, for somebody to get involved? Yeah, I think I think totally there is. Um, there's the Bamboo Bike Club where I bought my kit from. So they give me the components and a manual to put it together. Uh, Holy Spokes, which is a mechanic company in Bristol, they import frames from a company or a charity in Ghana who makes the frames. So it's happening off land, or, you know, offshore, if you want, in different countries. But it's about, yeah, it's about breaking the stigma of, oh, it's going to break or it's too expensive or too heavy. Uh, and hopefully Challenge 3000 will open up that avenue as well. A company might decide to start making frames and that'd be, I'd be, I'd be very happy to see that happening as well. that will be awesome. It'd be great to ride one of those bikes, I think, as well, just to see. Yeah, you, honestly, I mean... The, the reason I had the pain in the 24 hour world records is because I hadn't yeah. ridden it before. It is what, nothing to it? do with the framing. Do they um, customize it to your own, like, you know, when you do a bike fit, etc. cetera, do, do they customize the, no. no. So no. It, you, you had to rely on whatever was sent to you, but that, that could have been another reason that you had those pressure pains, I guess. Yeah. It was because I hadn't trained on it. My body wasn't accustomed to the pressure points. Yeah. Um <laughs> you know, to build up the resilience physically. Uh, that was that was why I was struggling so much. Uh, because even, even the time trial bike that I use for training that I've had since 2013, when I started doing eight plus hours, my body was responding the same, but I had time to make sure those areas were protected. Uh, I mean, we're obviously talking about my crotch. Um, and it's always, a, it, it always makes me laugh that, I've never talked about this area so much more before in my life but <laughs> uh, but yeah so so it was just I didn't have time for my body to 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 break to heal and then to grow back stronger in the skin so it, but it's like life we need to go through that pain to to make sure we heal from that injury it, be it emotional uh, and grow back stronger uh, but I didn't give my body the time to to do that yeah, but now I guess your new bike is all adjusted to your own, you know, your own measurements, etc. Yeah, uh, and it it should be fine. You use you're using components that you've you've maybe got used to before, so you'll have enough time to train for for Wales and for next year. Uh, would would you be doing the three thousand also on the same bamboo bike as well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. And it, cool. it equates to only 33 miles a day for three months. So it does sound a lot, 3,000 miles, and it is. But again, it's breaking it down into that realistic True. title. So, you know, I won't cycle every day. Some days I might do 100 miles and take a couple of days off. But it is a very realistic target because of the time. So, mm. um, yeah, I'm able to sort of not fear myself into thinking, how am I going to train for 3,000 miles? I don't have yeah. to yeah for sure all right and um yeah so thank you so much for for coming on the show you've been a great guest and thank you for sharing all the personal stuff that we we spoke about as well I know it's sometimes it's not as easy to talk about that if if you haven't done so before so appreciate you spreading that knowledge as well my pleasure thank you uh yeah I really appreciate the 
the space and you have great questions to be able to explore those areas as well. And thanks again and hopefully see you again soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. Hopefully on a bike ride next year. For yeah, the challenge. that'd be awesome. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kate. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.